Um, so we are delighted uh, to, and I'm just pulling up your official titles so I don't embarrass myself and get this wrong, but we're delighted to welcome Matt uh, from the College of Podiatry, uh, Katrina from APA, Australian Podiatry Association, and Ben uh, from Podiatry New Zealand, so Canada can make it. Um, we thought we might just start with each one of them giving us a really brief uh, sort of summary of the size of, of, of their organisation, just so we can all get an idea of, of how many members they're, they're dealing with and uh, you know, just just because we're going to run comparisons between the three countries I'm sure so it probably makes sense that we get a different an idea of the scale we're going to start northern hemisphere Matt we're going to go straight to you um, and uh, yeah just give us a rough idea currently of how many members we've got in our uh, college of podiatry and uh, how many sort of people there are in, in the back boardroom level that are looking after us so you, um, for the professional body, um, uh, the College of Podiatry, which has a uh, currently a trade union, not trade union arm as well, um, with a society that supports the members. We have approximately um, just shy of uh, ten thousand members, um, but within that membership, there are those who are um, uh, fully active, as in uh, practitioners, both in our national health service and in the private setting. And um, we have those who are in the student membership, as well as those who are in education research. Um, and some who are retired members but still maintain membership um, um, for um, ongoing professional reasons. Um, in the backroom staff, we have um, a, a chairman of the, um, uh, the professional body. Myself is my role as the provost of the college and the academic board uh, chairman myself. We also have a CEO and a number of people of the executive management team, um, along with a number of the secretariat, um, numbering in total um, around about to the 20 mark. Um, looking after us based in London, near London Bridge, um, and that covers um, both our trade union element, our practice education, clinical leadership, um, as well as marketing, um, external affairs, and um, obviously finance as well stuck in there. So it's, um, it's a fairly large organisation from an AHP, Allied Health Professional point of view within the uh, UK setting, and um, obviously we, we hope to continue to maintain that and if not grow as we attract people to the profession um, and retain people in what is a, a fantastic um, organization to be part of. Cool, so on, in summary, roughly 20 people looking after roughly 10,000. Reasonable summary? Uh, yes, I mean, it's, very, it's very whole, time, whole time equivalent to um, headcounts, but r roughly that, yes. Yeah, cool. Uh, Katrina, uh, Australia, how do you compare? Oh, well, we're, we're a little bit smaller than that. Uh, we would be sort of getting up in the vicinity of a couple of thousand members. And we have about 12 staff across the country. So we're based in Melbourne, but we have a, a fairly large office in New South Wales. Uh, and we also have offices in uh, Queensland, in Brisbane, in Adelaide. And we've just um, started with some staff over in Perth as well. Awesome. So you're, forgive my ignorance, you're national, you look after the, the entire country as a, as, a, as a body. Yes, we've we've just gone through a, a huge nationalisation process. So we were a federated structure where we had the Australasian Podiatry Council that was the national body, and then we had individual state organisations. But uh, yes, over the last few years, we've undertaken a, a very large process. Um, but yeah, it's a really exciting time for uh, podiatry in Australia because everybody um, across the country has all of our members had an overwhelming result to vote to go national. So it's it's a really big thing, and um, yeah, I'm thrilled it's happened. And uh, yeah, it's it's a great time for podiatry in Australia. Awesome. And uh, Ben, by no means did I need. Did I mean to leave you last? Um, but I know you. I think you probably numbers are, uh, are the smallest of the three. Just tell us uh, what your what your sort of uh, numbers are looking like. So to give you a quick overview, you know we're a country of four million, so we have around about just I think shy of four hundred registered podiatrists in New Zealand, for which Podiatry New Zealand represents about sixty five percent of those. So you're sort of talking mid two hundreds. Interestingly, when I was looking at it, per capita, uh, both Australia and UK tend to have about uh, half the number per, ca uh, sorry, twice the number per capita of podiatrists compared to New Zealand. So for you guys, I think it's around about one in every 5,000 people. For us, it's about one in every 10,000. 
Wow. Okay. So you guys are the busiest of all of us, right? Clinically. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we're going to get stuck straight into the questions. What will happen is we've got a couple that have come in beforehand that we'll run through and we'll get you give you all the chance to sort of answer and um, then we can sort of draw comparisons and see where the discussion takes us. And obviously in the meantime, anyone that's watching, 24 people currently, if they've got any questions, we've often, you know, we've obviously let them know that they're welcome to, 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 to fire away. Um, hopefully they won't be too mean or aggressive, and, uh, but obviously they're the questions that we can't control. But as they come in, Craig will be keeping an eye on them and, and if there's any relevant time to bring them up he'll uh, he'll pitch in as well um, but i'll get cracking with the first one which is um and forgive me because all, all of these questions have come from you've been emailed to me by uk uh members so i hope they still have some relevance across the countries but one of the um criticisms that that as matt will be familiar with that, that the college here and, and, and the association here often has aimed at them rightly or wrongly is that they don't engage with their members enough um, that can mean different things to different people, of course. But uh, Matt, do you think uh, that's valid? And, and if not, what you know, what's your take on it from from the other side of the ropes? Um, I think it's absolutely valid. If a member feels that the professional body is not supporting them, is not engaging with them, is not responding to them, that's an absolute valid uh, reason to have, and it's one that the professional body will want to make sure. Um, we are dealing with. Um, I'm thinking about academic and clinical questions when members are worried about um, uh, scope of practice, areas that are developing and making sure that they are supported and there's abilities to um, develop their practice through CPD, but also then through making sure that they've got the right insurance um, is, is an important part. So I think it's a very valid reason and a very valid criticism, but I think equally the challenge is with a huge number of members um, with not a, a massive resource to respond, then there can be those challenges. But that should never be an excuse in any walk of life. Just because one can't um, always um, respond um, doesn't mean that it's, it's a justification. But I think what we would hope to do is see that um, where members are struggling, that um, when we do respond is that how they then use that information and share it with others and help promote the positivity of podiatry is something. So. I think there's a lot more I could say, um, and I think we'll probably tease it out through other questions that may come in, but I think it is a valid point, but I would hope to say and see um, if I was on the other side as a receiver of um, the, the work that the college is doing that we are working tirelessly to make sure that we equip our members to be the best, to deliver the best care to our patients, uh, both in the NHS in the UK and in the private setting. Awesome. Um Katrina, we'll just keep the order the same because that's the way you're, you're, you're lined up on my screen. It will make me remember who I've asked. Uh, is this something that you you face in, in Australia? Uh, you, uh, is it something that you're regularly, uh, you regularly have targets at you that you don't engage with your membership? Well, look, I, th I think it's always a challenge trying to work out how members want to engage with the profession. Um, Having gone through this nationalisation process, we're now able to present a, a unified um, body across across the country, which um, certainly makes makes basically everything easier as an organisation. But you know, some some members still um, really value the um, monthly newsletter, so we we still send out a hard copy newsletter to people because people really like that. Um, conferences are huge because people love the social aspect and being able to um, catch up with people, meet um, you know, meet new people, deal with the trade exhibitors, and and meet people face to face. Um, and also, you know, it's really important to have that voice on the end of the phone that is really knowledgeable and is able to answer the questions in a in a meaningful and um, correct way for our members. So um, I, I think that the criticisms of us are, are few and far between at the moment because um, there's, there's a lot of excitement in, in podiatry in Australia and, and what this new nationalised organisation can do. That's awesome to hear. That's great to hear. Um, ben, come on, tell us, restore our faith. Tell us that everyone in New Zealand loves you and you no one ever <laughs> Uh, oh, look, historically, we have been challenged with that and just trying to find the right platform to communicate, as Katrina mentioned. Uh, 
some pe people want different forms of communication. Some like the small uh, sort of regional groups where they get together and they like us to organize those to get togethers. Some like hard copy mail, email, Facebook. There's so many platforms. And of course, trying to manage economies of scale here in uh, New Zealand, we have a very small secretary services, but they do a fantastic job. In, uh, in delivering service to our members. So they're very contactable. It runs a staff of about three with a fantastic CEO. And we've really been working hard to try and engage with people a little bit more. The criticism has been that we haven't been seen to be doing much yet. As a board, we know that we're busy getting things done. But again, just passing that information out. And, and prior to this going live, Craig alluded to it, We've been quite proactive on Facebook uh, with our CEO, uh, making sure that she almost uh, uses it as a diary of what's being done. And uh, it is a great way just to communicate with everybody that things are ticking along, that activity is happening, that their, um, their registration costs are going towards something. <laughs> uh, and Craig, Craig, you've said this before, you, you know, you think the best use of a, of a professional body or a professional association social media channels, Facebook pages, is to act as a diary uh, in that exact way that New Zealand have got that name because it's, it's not the public that are reading those pages, it's, it's the members. So, putting out of um, health articles seems a bit fruitless when it's the members that are following the page. You're, you're, you've been pretty vocal about that, haven't you, Craig, in a previous episode? Yeah, well, we, we it came up with the episode with Jill Woods, and I, I you know, what, what is the role of the professional organisations in social media? And I, I, I and again, I, I, that's what I like about what Podatra New Zealand are doing. That the, the CEO Jennifer here often uses this as her diary. So here she is chairing an allied health meeting. Here she is at Parliament before a select committee. So the, the members actually know that they're doing something, and I think. Um, you have to, I have to apologise again about my dogs barking in the background. And I, <laughs> I, I, I get a bit exasperated often when I see professional organisations sort of sharing foot health information because the general public aren't going to be checking professional organisations' Facebook pages. Um, the people checking these Facebook pages are going to be their members to see what they're up to. And that's why I think that's, why they, that's what they should be used for. I mean, there, there's so much foot health information being shared so widely by so many different people already on social media that the professional organizations don't necessarily need to do it. I think they, it's about who, who is the audience in social media of these professional organizations. And I think they are the members and that's where they need to be targeting it from. But I'm pretty sure. And I, I think Ben and I chatted about this before we started that the, the, perhaps the, the people who complain the loudest are the ones that are not on social media and don't know what's going on. So I don't know how you others feel about what the role of the, the, the social the social media pages for professional organisations should be. Um, no one's asking, was it? <laughs> Matt, Matt, let's talk about the College of Podiatry's Facebook page. Uh, 10,000 members. I don't know followers off the top of my head it's got on Facebook, but it's definitely not 10,000, is it? Um, yeah. How much, uh, how much time goes into to, to looking after it? Do, do, do the society realise what, what an incredible resource it is to, to connect with, with their members nowadays? But I think it's only an incredible resource if the members are on it and are following it themselves. So yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a big tweeter. Um, and whenever I go to various uh, conferences, um, I will put my tweet um, out there, I will get people to, um, you know, add the, the college in, add the society in, um, uh, add, as, um, add myself in, because then I can retweet and add things. So I think the frustration we have um, is that not many people are on it. Now, I think what you can see as Craig is scrolling through now is basically it's sort of what he's saying. So you can see what our CEO has been doing, Steve, recently, and the fact that we've had some presentations, we've been over in Ireland, um, waiting recently about a whole thing about the pay review. We've been looking at um, um, the, the, the way in which funding is happening within the NHS. So I think what this is quite good is engaging our members in showing what the professional body is doing about getting our name out there. Um, and I think what um, I like to do is that I would love um, a, a more of a social media presence for members to articulate what they are doing for their, their patients, not the details, obviously, but to go, you know, this is what I can offer, this is what podiatry can offer, etc. So I think 
the way in which we share and promote what the profession is that we need to talk more about what we do um but hopefully from what craig's just shown it shows i think we're fairly engaged but engaged with the information but i don't think we've quite got enough people on board with what facebook is and maybe i'll just throw it out there as a, a, a as a asian provocateur is has the potential the negative impact of facebook recently um and the cambridge analytica and all those type of things maybe scared people away no 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 the, the stats don't support that that's that, been yeah absolutely but i suppose i suppose you've got to look at our age population of our membership that's probably one thing we haven't discussed so far that's a good point i suspect we're i suspect we are older than australia and new zealand do we have do you guys well, sorry, I, I think spot? i think by definition in the world we are yes uh, yeah i mean what's the average age of a, of a member in college of podiatry um, yeah, of numbers to hand. Uh, yeah, not to hand but from the last review we did um um the bell-shaped curve is very much above 40 above 40 i'm guessing australia new zealand uh, katrina ben it's, it's going to be lower than that i'm assuming is that fair yeah i i think we're more sort of in the 30s yeah. now uh, yeah and i don't have any exact statistics but i would assume that we're a bit younger as well yeah so the, you you could argue that um younger generations are far more more media savvy i mean i think that's a reasonable comment um the other thing to point out, of course, is that, you know, people that point criticism at you guys for, for not being engaged, well, all three of you have kindly agreed to give up your time and, and do this. And if this isn't being engaged with um, with people uh, in social media, then I don't know what is. And, um, you know, we've, we've shouted about this for the last week and we've had on average 26 slash 27 people watching. So um, you could argue who, who are the non-engaged people here um, <laughs> just, to, just to kind of... Just to, just to stoke the fire a little bit, right? Um, well, I certainly think it goes actually. both ways too. Sorry, I, yeah, I, I certainly yeah, think it goes I, both I ways. Right. You know, I think the podiatrist has a professional responsibility to keep engaged as well. Uh, it can't just be a one-way street. They need to be um, reciprocating in that and being involved as well, rather than waiting to be spoon-fed information. So I, I, I would suggest they need to get on social media if that's the primary platform. And there are also, I know as a board, we've we've talked about some of the risks that can be associated with engaging on Facebook with your members as well, because sometimes the discussions can lead to, you know, personal attacks on people, or if people are giving an opinion that is factually incorrect, um, you know, around clinical decisions or something. So I think sometimes you have to weigh up the risks of um, this is an official association Facebook page and if there are things going on there that you can't control or you know you're you're a bit slow to moderate there's there are some risks around that as well. There was a there was a perfect example of that late last year it was actually being the Physiotherapy Association of New Zealand posted on their Facebook page a article something to do with back pain and posture and it was really bad. And all these physios from all around the world launched quite vicious attacks against the Physiotherapy Association in New Zealand for sharing that. Because, and I agree, it really was that bad. So they ended up, they ended up being deleted. Um, but people kept screenshots of it. So yeah, you're right, there are dangers associated with it. And they took a lot of heat for something that I'm sure someone in the office thought it was quite an innocent share. Um, it didn't go down very well at all. The biggest challenge that we have in uh, New Zealand is most of the time when a photo is taken, you know, of a, say for example, um, when we're having a meeting just to alert members is the person tends to take the most terrible photo. <laughs> and I don't know how many shots they take or whether it's the first one or they select the worst, but man, we've had some shockers. <laughs> <laughs> Gee. Yeah. Yeah, well. <laughs> Well, wait till you see the screenshots that come out of this chat. Um, I was going to say, let's not do any screen scrots here. <laughs> well, there, will be, there, there will be, and there's no way that one of us won't have a lazy eye. There's no way <laughs> that all five of us will be look good. Um, ben, you, you hit the nail on the head for me then when you commented about responsibility being a two a two way street. It's bi directional. I think I think that's absolutely spot on, and um, it, it tees up uh, as if by magic one of our questions from beforehand, which was. Um, uh, 
what point do you think are, there are certain roles that are the sole responsibility of the members or the sole responsibility of um, the, the professional bodies? Because, you know, for clearly something like promotion of the professions in our respective countries, often the members will, will complain that the, the professional bodies aren't doing enough to promote it. And the professional bodies will quite rightly say, well, you know, you've got you to pull your weight a bit there. Do you, do you think there is a line that you can draw in the sand and say, okay, these jobs are definitely ours, these jobs are definitely ours? So is everything a, a team approach? Uh, let's go to you first, Ben, because it was your your shot class off this track. A uh, really difficult question to, to answer is where does the line get drawn? Um, I think it very much is a two-way street that everybody has that responsibility to promote the profession. We're all in it together. Uh, the, uh, the association belongs to the members. Uh, they are the association and it's their responsibility as professionals to, um, to promote uh, best practice and, and, and the quality service that podiatry is. And certainly in, in podiatry New Zealand, our aim is to advance uh, the quality of and access to podiatry. So whenever we've got anything that comes up that we're considering doing, we always benchmark that against, is it improving quality? Uh, both, well, primarily for the public, everything focuses on the public, but is it improving the quality of the service or the access to podiatry? And that's how we check ourselves in regards to the activities that we do and the roles that we take. Uh, as we've become more structured over the years um, in creating sort of um, baseline sustainability uh, foundations, we're moving much more now into advocacy. Craig mentioned it before that, you know, luckily we're in the halls of parliament at this stage trying to advocate for podiatry. Um, but I believe it's very much a two-way street. Uh, Katrina, any, any, any thoughts? It does, it does. Thanks. Uh, mm. Katrina, any, any additional thoughts? Yeah, well, look, it's, it's a really important role of the association and, and certainly um, really important in Australia. I know we, we always get feedback from our members that advocacy is pretty close to the the top um, member benefit that they see but I mean we're we've sort of got ourselves into a position where we're the oldest and largest um, representative body of podiatrists in in the country so we are the the body that government and academia and uh, the healthcare networks will come and, and speak to. So we, we certainly take that representation very seriously and, and try to do as, as much as we can for the profession. But also I think members um, and podiatrists forget that their, their role in, you know, firstly the most important thing they can do to advocate for the profession is to be the best healthcare practitioner that they can be and get the best outcomes for their patients because Word of mouth is incredibly important, but but also doing things like um, volunteering at their local sporting club and you know working with the football club, the hockey club. This this sort of thing is incredibly important, and I think that's one of the the greatest um, influences on our profession is the you know the general public getting having a great experience with a podiatrist and. Um, seeing what we're capable of and um, telling other people about that. Brilliant. And Matt, anything to add? I suspect there's going to be echoes here, but... Um... Um, in, in absolutely, um, in support of all those, but I think very clearly what the professional body is there for is to advocate um, uh, for the profession within the regulatory bodies, within government, as we've have seen um, with uh, colleagues in New Zealand, with ourselves around pressing forward around independent prescribing around um, protecting workers' rights, around working with trade unions, around um, understanding um, you know, pay rises, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what the professional body is there, is to take a unified voice at a senior level to government and regulatory bodies. That needs obviously the support of the membership to get behind that, agree with that, vote on that, but also then um, echo those comments out in the big wide world. The big thing I think you may be alluding to, and maybe this is where the questions may go is, the argument could be the professional body isn't doing enough to tell the nation what podiatry is and I think that's going to be slightly different in the three countries I've been to Australia a number of times I've never had the pleasure of going to New Zealand but that's um, booked for next February 
Um, and um, especially in Australia, you say podiatry and you, nobody blinks. You know exactly what it is, what it does, what it means. Um, it's very sport orientated. Um, and I've got many friends who have trained here and now out there working and having a fantastic life and also really enjoying their profession. I think in the UK, we've struggled with this dichotomy of our name. I think we've just, we've struggled with really identifying ourselves in the past, but I think we are getting there now that it is very clear with the patients I treat from um, high level um, athletes that um, like yourself Ian, are involved in and colleagues to advances in podiatric surgery to access to you know, prescription only medicines podiatry really is on the map. The professional body has taken us so far. We can shout about it all we want. The line is then crossed. If the members don't articulate that enough, if they don't get out there and sell themselves, not the profession themselves, that's the way we get Because exactly what um, was just being said is that it's all about the experience that the public have of the profession. That means the next time they say, have you got a foot problem? They'll, the first person they'll say, the first thing they'll say is you need to see a podiatrist. Yeah, just following up on yeah. the, the advocacy role and the, I'm trying, it was like a, it's a whole lot of questions in one, but it's almost looking at the, the number of people in each country who are not members of the professional body and what they complain the most about. And then I take Katrina's point about when members are surveyed, what do you want? It's that, advocate's role is rated very highly, yet I my best guess is for those who aren't members and those who complain a lot, it's it, it, they're not seeing, say, dollar value for that. They want to see a, a, a return on their, what they spend immediately. They don't see that, you know, like if I'm a member now, I'm, you know, there's been 20 years of advocacy gone before that's got the profession to where it is. And I just... Like I, my question sort of it's around what are these expectations of these non-members? I think they're very, very different to the expectations of members. And that's sort of what my question's around. Well, Craig, I, you know, I was thinking about this as everyone was talking. I think one of the difficulties um, is getting it right because we're, we're a membership organisation and we are for our members, but in advocating for the profession, the, the benefits that we achieve are of course extended to the non-members as well. So um, our membership can be, um, you know, you, you do get some tensions around that point, but, you know, <laughs> I suppose it would be wonderful if we could say, well, we want this to happen, but it can only be for our members, but, you know, we are here for the betterment of the profession. And uh, we hope that, you know, our members understand that and, and we'll see the, the value in that. Yeah, but I think it's the non-members that are not seeing the value in that. <laughs> and I, I, yeah, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah, well, and, and sometimes too, it's, it's how much, <clears throat> sort of have the, the race to the bottom. If How much do, what people want to pay for membership is hard because, you know, do, if I make it $100 cheaper, will that, you know what what is um, a person's value proposition is is difficult oh no I've, I've always said you if you halved your membership fee you're not going to double your members I mean you know it doesn't work like that unfortunately I mean I you think, should I think I think for me, I think the, the point is you say well I'm paying in now um, so all the stuff that you're talking about that you've done well I didn't pay for so what else are you gonna do for me now? And I think it's a fairly good question because I, I have always said, you know, I will get to the you know, point in my career where I need to step back and others need to step up because when I was new in the profession, I wanted to get involved and, and make a difference. Um, so I suppose the point is, it's the same as in, in the UK, and I can only use the UK as an example in that, you know, you pay in, um, uh, into, into a system, into a membership organisation. The benefit you've got is that you are reaping the rewards of what's gone before you and you are now going to be paying forward for the rewards that will happen in the future and you may be part of that you may see it in real in, in real time or not but i think for me the really important thing that we need to understand is that if we don't do these things if we don't pay in if we don't have these organizations and the fantastic news obviously of australia coming together um in in this one unified way is 
the benefits to the overall profession, which we should be proud of, will be immeasurable. Whether you see them immediately intangible is different to the long term. And I think that's the legacy we also always need to leave as a as a professional uh, in any way or, or a member of this wonderful world. Yes. But perhaps that's the problem. It's the perception of the non-members of the, of the rewards that have come yeah. before and the rewards are going to happen in the future. They, um, they, they want to see it now. I'm paying money now. I want a service now, you know, is what they, their expectation. So we, we, we recently had a discussion on one of our UK podiatry forums about um, within our membership, what we don't have, what we don't get given is access to journals. What we don't get given is a, an Athens log on or a Sibboleth log on or you know, whatever the New Zealand, Australia equivalents are. And um, therefore, if you go into private practice, if you're not in the NHS, you're not in academia, it becomes very difficult to access research, to access articles, uh, to read them. Um, Someone recently did some maths and worked out that given how many members we have and given how much an organisational membership to get this kind of access is, it would work out about £5 per head, extra membership per annum for every member. And someone put a, a poll out, I'm sure you saw it, Matt, someone put a poll out saying, would everyone be willing to pay £5 more per year to get full access to Athens and, and, and you know, the evidence base? And not everyone said yes, which is utterly unbelievable. Now I have full access via an academic institute, but I would still pay five pounds extra to know- A year, per year. A year, exactly. I would still pay, I would still pay five pounds per year extra. Firstly, because that's one coffee in London. But secondly, it's not about me getting access, it's about me now knowing that my entire profession has access. But some people were saying, well, I wouldn't pay that, that's a waste of money. I was like, how on earth can five pounds a year for full access to the evidence base be a waste of money and i think this is what we're dealing with right i mean do you guys in, in new zealand australia as part of your membership do you have access to journals no no um quite simply it, it's something that we'd, we'd like to do i think what we're trying to do at the moment is again differentiate the services and offerings that our members can provide possibly compared to those that are that are non-members um, to give you a little bit of backstory, we don't have a system such as the NHS or anything along those lines uh, here that works in that way. It really is uh, a, a sole practitioner businesses. I think about 75% of all registered podiatrists in New Zealand are, are, are sole practitioners. Um, and you'd only find probably about 3% working in secondary care under hospital systems. So we're a country of private practices. And what we're trying to do is uh, differentiate the services that the um, podiatrists can offer. For example, um, we introduced a, a clinic handbook, which is a um, sort of a quality benchmark uh, to allied health standards. And we developed this, uh, this, this handbook and it uh, has all the systems, the policies, the procedures in place for, um, for again, high quality services. Now, a person can go through that, get audited by a third party and get certified. And then with our advocacy, we can possibly talk to these hospitals, insurance companies, government departments and so forth and say, these particular individuals that have gone through this process have a quality of service that you can be satisfied uh, yeah. guarantees some great outcomes. And so doing those sorts of things and access to sports fundamentals and sports competency trainings and all of those sorts of things. So hopefully we can differentiate where our members sit in the view of the public uh, and the service delivery that they offer. So that, that's one of the big sort of things that we're doing. That's awesome. fantastic. Okay, let's to change the topic slightly. We just got a question. Well, it came a wee while ago from um, Dave James. Question for all speakers: What are the most common questions that you get from your members? Who wants that one first? Australia, <laughs> Katrina. Uh, <laughs> well, I I know that um, you know we will we can get all sorts of uh, questions from the membership, but I I'm quite passionate about the fact that the Podiatry Association should be the source of truth for our membership. So whatever question they ask, we should be giving them the right answer. So it, it can be, a you know, some people will have a specific practice question regarding 
infection control, then, you know, we, we need to be able to send them towards the resources um, on our website that are available to the membership about that. Um, we also have um, access to a human resources um, line. So we, we buy in a, a service um, for that. So that's a really valued um, thing by our membership. But yeah, really we get questions about everything. Um, weird and wonderful, some, some things are very straightforward and very easy to answer and, and some you know, our, our staff will have to, um, you know, so I'll, I'll have to get back to you and, and they might call a, a board member or something to, to get a particular um, answer about, a, you know, what is potentially a small niche area in podiatry that um, they're unsure of. From our point of view, um, the, the, we, we get a huge range of questions coming in, but they're all relatively simple administrative ones where people are requiring clarity. They're just not so sure about what's going on and they need that reassurance and clarity. So as I said, a, a country full of uh, small businesses and some of them can feel a little bit isolated at times. Um, and they just need those basic questions answered. Ones where, imagine if you were working in a busy hospital, you'd ask around the coffee table uh, at, at morning tea, but these are the ones that they need to, to ring up uh, the organisation and just seek some clarity. That would be the most common sort of scenario. Matt? Um, for us, I think um, we get an awful lot of, I think we've touched on this, what are you doing to... Um, let people know what podiatry is so they don't think it's kids um what are you doing to um secure the future of it um how are you going to support my business growing in the private setting and how are you going to um, make sure that nhs services don't get cut in the uh, funding but i think also we get an awful lot of am i insured to do this can i do this in my practice is this within the scope of podiatry so similar to what uh, Katrina was saying, what Ben was saying about just some of those, uh, and quite often they're quick answers, because yes. Um, and, and I've always been very clear to people, no question is a stupid question because we should never stifle what our members uh, want to ask. Um, but I think the fundamental focus for us is what are you doing to make sure that podiatry is known in this country? And I think we've touched on some of that as we've gone along so far. Okay, here's a, here's a, here's a follow up question. Stupid question, but like, so, yeah. so some of them are stupid, right? Yeah. No question. <laughs> oh. well, no question. No question is like your go-to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, that's a full beard. It's going around the sides. It's just a light that you can't see it. Bill Ginger. Uh, add on to that. Um, a uh, quick add on to that. The uh, is it, all the questions that come in. You know, when patients contact us, generally it's because there's a problem. If things are going well and, and, and beautiful, we don't hear from people. We tend to hear from them when there's a problem. People are more likely to complain than they are to compliment. Do you ever get companies saying, just to say, guys, you know, great job, love, love your work? Does that ever happen? Yeah. All the time. It does. Yeah. Uh, apart from the ones that I send you, Matt, though. Uh, anyone else other than me? Do? <laughs> I, I think it's usually over a specific thing. I, I, it might happen. I, I certainly don't hear that, you know, every day we'll just have a member call up and say, I love you. But it's, <laughs> you know, we can get a lot of positive responses to a specific thing that has happened. Members will ring up and say it's fantastic. And, you know, on, on the adverse side of that, sometimes you'll get members, you know, bringing up about a specific thing saying they're not happy about it. So... Um, I, you know, as, as you've said, I think people are, are more likely to ring up and, and voice their displeasure than to ring up and um, congratulate. And, you know, it's the same with everything, isn't it? Actually, just on that voicing, voicing their displeasure issue, how often, though, is that a misplaced expectation? <clears throat> yeah, well, it, you know, it's, it's always hard to... Um, setting expectations with with people and you know advocacy is one of those difficult things because um you know you can spend a lot of time in and a lot of money engaging with the government and you know this goes on and on and on and then 
usually it just you have that one thing that changes and and the floodgates open and, and you celebrate but um it's it's yeah that the lead up to things can be a, you know long and hard and a lot of work goes in and then you know you just have that one moment where where it all happens and that's fantastic you get you get to celebrate but um yeah they can be few and far between unfortunately a quick follow-up from me on this um just running a parallel with the, the way patients contact us in our, in our clinics as well we all have those patients that that contact us more than other patients you know the ones there that, that they will happily send regular emails you know, you'll see their name drop into the inbox but you're like oh it's this guy again or this this girl again uh, without obviously naming any names you, you must have members known members that are far more um far more likely to contact you than others I'm, I'm guessing right i mean is that is that reasonable do you ever do you have members that are emailing you weekly Well, they're not emailing me. <laughs> they might be emailing the association. Um, oh, look, there, there are some members that are far more engaged um, than, than others. And <clears throat> also some of our different states, um, you know, that if you've had an executive officer that's been there for a long time or a staff member that's been there for a long time, I think the members will build up relationships with particular staff as well. So... Um, you know, those relationships are, are quite, quite common as well, or um, members will feel comfortable to, to ring up and discuss issues with people. So that's, that's nice. Do you welcome that? Do you think it's better that someone's in contact more than someone that's never contacted you in a decade? Or surely when we're talking about this two directional engagement, you'd rather people did pick up the phone or did email you, right? Well, we, we hope that our members think about us and, and think as, us as a, uh, a really good um, source of knowledge and um, professional information. Actually, that reminds me of that old cliche. Sorry. Oh, say, it, reminds me of that old cliche. it reminds me of that old cliche, um, the members are the reason for your work, not an interruption to your work. Um, but one thing that did occur to me is more and more especially larger companies are getting harder and harder to contact that you, they have more FAQs on their website. And even when you say, fill out a contact us form, an algorithm searches their FAQs for a reply before you even send it. So I, I wonder if there's not time for a few barriers to be put up to let staff get on with other things so that there's more, uh, I don't know. I just, I just see this, this trend happening, especially in corporates, big corporates are harder and harder to get contacts. Um, what do you, what do you think Matt about that? Cause you've got the biggest membership here. So for example, we're just going through our regulatory body, um, revalidation, as you will know, Ian, hopefully you've had your email or your uh, letter through the post. Um, uh, um, if you haven't, maybe they've just decided just to suspend you already. Um, uh, and we have set up as, as the college a, a specific email address, which is audit at scpod.org, to, uh, to have members um, have an easy route in because we're going to get lost to questions who are going to have to do their audit for their revalidation so we can support them in that regard. Um, so there is always going to be an awful lot that, that, that comes in. Um, for me, it's about having the right FAQs is not a bad thing. I don't mind if a, an automated system comes up and gives me the answer. At the end of the day, all I want is the answer. But if it's not, what the, the machine should be able to do is direct you to a person that does know the answer. So you don't have to wait too long. So I think there's a balance. But I take Craig's point that sometimes it can feel a bit faceless. But at the end of the day, in this um, age of having these devices, I want to type into Mr. Google or Dr. Google and get my answer as quick as possible. If my professional body's website can give me the answer I want to a simple question. Brilliant. Yeah, well, I, think that's, I think that's my point, Matt, on the, on the, the, the audit issues and a perfect example is, is that how much staff time do you want to devote to that versus devote their time to something else that may or may not be more important when yeah. a lot of the inquiries are possibly trivial. A lot of them are probably really easy answered through an FAQ. So it's, it's having an automated system to 
get them to go through this FAQ system before they actually get to, it, to take up a staff member's time. And that's, I think that's the point I'm trying to get at, is, that, is there going to be more of that in the future? And I, I think there should be. Um, bad, bad, bad point. What do you think, Ben? I was just going to say for us, we're trying to head in the other direction. We want to encourage engagement. We want, uh, and, and we have the, the, the ability to do that with such a small number, uh, but we want to get to know our members. And it's so easy when we've got them on the phone or contacting with the email, because it's not always the main, you know, they may ring up with a question, but that leads into other discussions and other questions and can give us a better idea of their needs uh, going forwards and how we can better service them and maybe some of the challenges they've got. So we're really trying to encourage that relationship development, which can often only occur in one-to-one in -one collaboration. If I think you've got the si the smaller size exactly. where, where probably yourself and, and Jennifer probably knows every, every member personally and probably every non-member as well. <laughs> I totally and agree. And it's, it. Yeah, and, and that's one of the, the, the brilliant things with having uh, the small number. So often, you know, those economies of scale are a challenge. We're in this situation. It's a good thing. Uh, the, a question came in from Dave James again uh, a, little bit, a few, few minutes ago, which uh, seems like a reasonable one to possibly round up on looking at we're, we're almost hitting the hour mark here. And that is, what, what is the vision for the future? What do the respective professional bodies uh, plan? For? How far ahead do they plan? Where, you know, like when you're in an interview, where do you see yourself in five years? That, kind of classic question that none of us like to be asked we're now going to ask all three of you um we'll go ben we'll go to you because i mean you know again i don't know whether the size of the organization factors into this at all um is the vision purely about growing it or where do you see yourself in five years again just developing on with the the quality and access uh side of things we want to be able to deliver uh better quality products to our to our um, members to help them develop uh, their, their practice quality and their systems and so forth. Uh, also, we'd like to work more with our allied health colleagues uh, in, in delivering patient care. So that's where that advocacy work comes in and moving and, and having another string to our bow rather than just, again, being private practices. Uh, we really want to make sure that we are entrenched uh, not only in private practice, but in secondary care as well with better support too for our students coming out and transitioning into the profession. Uh, often when we don't have that secondary care model, there's a, um, uh, a difficult transition from people coming straight out of, of college and then going directly into a private practice. So we're trying to help that along as well. Awesome. Um, Katrina, I mean, you've, you've obviously had a, a brilliant couple of years with a sort of unification, so to, so to speak. Do you do you think further ahead? Where, where do you see it all heading? Yeah, well, we're, we're going through our strategic planning cycle at the moment. Um, it's the first chance we've had as, as this new organisation, which is fantastic. And, you know, our, our aims are to lead and influence the podiatry profession to develop our members and improve patient outcomes that... Um, one of the really big things that we've been developing in Australia is a career pathway. Um, and we have some pathways already established in sports podiatry and in also in paediatric podiatry. Um, we're working on a high risk foot framework at the moment as well. And we see these as really important things for our, our membership. We think they will be something that is unique two members of the association and I, I think moving forward seeing um, what health health funds are doing what the government is doing I think um, these sort of standardized frameworks and um, you know getting a, a tick against your name as, as being credentialed in certain areas um, is appealing and I think it you know down the track I can see that type of thing being more a mandatory um, thing required of health funds and potentially in, in the public sector as well. So we've been working really hard with that and also um, developing a, a practice um, credentialing process through an external body that's um, offered to our membership as well. Awesome. Matthew? 
Um, gosh, OK, I think for us, we've just sort of come near to the end of our recent cycle of uh, strategic planning within the professional body. I think the focus absolutely is on making sure that we are uh, strong as an organisation going forward. You've got a new CEO who's recently in post, um, Steve, who has been fantastic in pushing uh, so many things forward. We've got a good new structure in our executive management team. And so that's getting the foundations right so that we can build on that. But I think then the focus for us, as well as a, a, a very much more um, advanced in years population, I think compared to um, our colleagues in Australia and New Zealand, is the challenges we have now around foot health in general and how we're going to deliver that. And I think our real push now is around public health and prevention. And so the strategic vision of the organisation is to get um, the phrase I have is if you think ten, if you think teeth, sorry, most people think dentist. Uh, we need to get to the point where people think feet, they think podiatrist, and we should be able to get to the point where prevention is at the forefront, and we're not seeing patients at the point at which they need remedial work and and um, treatment that is almost too late. We want to see them early, so that's one of the big things. And I think ultimately it is doing what members want, and and making sure we fly that flag at the highest level. Um, in um, the Department of Health, in, um, in government um, and in the regulatory bodies that we are flying the flag that foot health is vital for this nation and if you want to do it you need to invest in education, in support and in jobs both in the private and in the um, uh, public sectors. Brilliant. Uh, Craig, one question has just come in from uh, from Ian Riley, specifically from Matt. Um, of course, he has. Are we okay, if we ask it. Are we okay if we ask it. Is that all right, Craig? Are we good for time? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Well, there is. I thought, I thought you were miming at me. Um, question from Matt: How does the SCP? How does the you know the society linking with the IOCP, for example? You might just want to give our other guests a, a bit of a background on that one. I'll leave that to you. Uh, how does it link in for the greater good with the UK being so splintered? Um, thanks, Ian. Good to have you uh, watching. Welcome. Um, so the, um, I, I suppose a good way of understanding is there if there were colleagues um, from Canada online, um, they would understand the difference between those the two professional bodies. Um, and there's been issues um, there, as I'm sure a lot of us, if you, if you know more of the international history of how that has been difficult, um, over there, we have two professional bodies, um, two well-known professional bodies. There's us as the college with the society, um, as the trade union arm, and then there's the institute. Um, I, I, I think it's a bit unfair for Ian to indicate that this is a, a splintered setup. Um, we are bigger and that does make us better. It makes us who we are. And I'm not here to say that we are better. The institute, the institute is a group of um, professionals who have got together and they have formed um, um, an association that is there to support their members and they do that. And that's not, I'm not here to disparage against that, but we are um, the primary um, um, deliverer of this from a membership organization point of view. Would I like to see unification in the same way that Australia have, have delivered? Um, yes, why not? Because I think you are stronger together. Um, I don't think that's particularly for the debate on this um, event as to the goods, the bads and the uglies of that, but. At the end of the day, um, our organisation is to champion foot health um, to be done evidence based in the right setting by the right people. Um, and that's what we're going to work towards. Great. Thanks, Matt. I think on that note, the hour, the hour has gone. Um, as per normal, we could probably continue on for um, another hour, but some of us have to get on with our lives. Um, for, that, <laughs> for those of you who have just joined, um, I see quite a few people have just joined in the last 10 minutes. Um, come back in 15 minutes. This Facebook render this video and it'll be available for a replay. There are my dogs barking again. Um, this, this will be on YouTube uh, later on today. Slow internet speeds here means it takes me a while to upload it. So thanks everyone for listening. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Katrina. And thanks, Ben. Um, the, the hour has gone quickly.